here we go. We are in En Yaakov, and we're in Masech uh, Brachot, and fifty six A two for those in the art scrolls. So it says we're still on the Abaya for Rabbi. We're going to Barhelia, the the uh, dream interpreter. So and and Rabbi still has not discovered that he has to pay. Rabbi still has not discovered that he has to pay Barhelia to get a good interpretation. So we go on. It says Akrina and Bechelman. <clears throat> in our dreams, that we uh, the verse was read to us that Leich Echol Besimcha Lachmcha. Go eat your bread with joy. The Abaya Amar Leiso to Abaya Barhedya said this means Marvach As Iskach Veechalta Veshat your business will prosper. You will eat and drink in abundance. Bekarad Pesuka Mechedva Delibach and your hearts great joy. You will recite this this verse. Well, Rabbi Amarle, but however, to Rabbi says, "Psid iskach tevacht v'lo achalt v'shatid." Your business will fail. You will slaughter meat, but will not have the appetite to eat or drink. V'karat lafuche lefachuche pachdach, and to mitigate your anxiety, you will recite you will recite this hopeful verse. So he says this, and uh, the, uh, the Rashi is saying, and this uh, this verse will not represent reality to you, but a distant hope. While you while you are impoverished, you will recite it and pray for your lot to improve. The Marsha adds that it was then the custom for people to recite this optimistic verse for those who experienced misfortune, so as to console themselves and offer them hope for the future. Okay. So now another dream. Akrin and Zera Rav Totsiya Sada. They said, now a dream. They read this following verse. You will take abundant seed out to the field, but you will harvest little, for the locust will devour it. Labaye Amrale Mereshe. So Tobaya Bahardi stated that from the first part of the verse, he told them that he would be blessed with abundance. Lurav Amrale Mesefe. But to Ravi, he goes to the end part. And he told him that his efforts to earn a proper living would prove futile. So that's interesting. He takes the verse and he says to the one who pays him, you get the first part, and when it doesn't pay, you get the last part. Okay, another dream. Akriina and Zaytim, Yulacha, the whole Gubach, Gubalacha. The verse that they threw red words, you will have olive trees throughout your boundaries, but you will not anoint with oil. For your oils will drop from the trees. And again, a very sad thing. So again, he does the same thing. He explained from the first part, he told him you would have abundance. And again, he says to the end, you, uh, your efforts to earn money would, would not happen. And because of the last part of the verse. You understand what he's doing? If you pay him, again, it's a simple thing. If I pay you, you give me a good interpretation. If I don't pay you, you get a bad interpretation. So what he does is he splits the verse up. So, okay. Akrina, uh, again, in another dream, they had Then all the peoples of the earth will see that the name of Hashem is proclaimed over you, and they will fear you. So that sounds like a nice dream. I mean, nice verse. Amrle, so Baye, he told uh, Barhead, he told Abaye, this means Nafakle Shema Duresh Metifta Havet. Your name will spread far and wide, for you will become the head of an academy. A Matach Naflat Baalma, the world will hold you in awe. Mm-hmm. Great. So it's, it's great for Rava, Abaye, now the Rava, Amrle, Beidaina, the Malka Itvar, the king's treasury, we've broken into. Umid bast beganave, and you will be arrested as a thief. Vedanikuli alma kovachoma minach, and then everyone will construct a kovachoma argument from you, and they will learn to fear based upon your experience. That is, they will say, if the authorities have arrested the great Rava and charged him with thievery, they may well level the same baseless charge against any of us. Okay. So, okay, here we go. Uh, the Arch scroll says for Abaye, the phrase, they will fear you, was taken as a portent of the awe and reverence which Abaye would be held by the masses. However, for Rava, 
the verse was seen as pretending a disaster that would soon befall Rava, which in turn would cause great, a great fear of similar calamities to come to the community. Okay, here we go. So now what happens? Lamachar. As it happened on the following day, doesn't necessarily have to be the following day, but assume it is, the king's treasury was indeed broken into. And they came and arrested Rava. Can you yes. The dream, the dream came true. Again, you have to be careful for the interpretation. If I was Rava, I would have gone, stopped going already. <laughs> <laughs> I would have given it up. <laughs> Amale, they said to him, again, they go back to him, Chazan Chasa Alpum Dani. We saw lettuce resting on the mouth of a keg. La Abaye Amale, so the Abaye, he told Barhead, he told Abaye, if Iskach Kechasa, your business will double like lettuce, namely, it should be, become very profitable, and he's, they explain, the leaves of lettuce are wide and they press flat against one another as if doubled over one another. So Barhadi told Abaye that his dream portends a doubling in his profits. The keg or barrels viewed in this and subsequent dreams was interpreted by Barhadi as a, a symbolic of business or merchandise. This is because, and this is an interesting uh, point, Abaye and Rafa were both wine merchants by trade. So here, by the way, uh, Rashi puts that into it. Here you see a very important thing that is sometimes discounted in the world today. Rabbis had regular jobs, yeah. which is, by the way, and this is only me saying it, I don't know if anybody really agrees with what I'm about to say, but that's why the rabbis were so ingenious when it came to business or not ingenious, it's the wrong word. They were so sensitive to business, so sensitive to real life as we as we live it, because they were in the business world. They were wow. act wow. they weren't in the ivory towers of wow. of the scholastic world. In the ivory tower of scholastic world, and that's what you find in colleges and even in Yeshiva today, they're really not connected. Hmm. They don't know what's going on. They're or at least it seems that they don't know what's going on. And they answer questions based upon that. I'll never forget that I had a Rebbe in NYU yeah. who was a poet. He was a poet. I mean, he's Nifter right now. Uh, rest in peace. But he just recently died. He used to have a shul on... So I was walking... Uh, west side of... Uh, in the 90s, I guess. 70s. The 70s in New York City. Mm -hmm. It was a small shul. He was different in his shul from the from the yeshiva. In the yeshiva, he was very yeshivish. <laughs> to say it like that, he he is all the theoretical. Yeah, it was everything in theory. And so when you would want to ask a practical question, he would say that this is not the place for that. It was interesting because we were learning shulchan aruch. <laughs> you would think that that's, yeah. that's what you want to get into. Let's get into it. It's, it's not the theory anymore. Oh, We're yeah. learning Hilchas uh, Bas Vachala. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Bas Vachala, Tarubot, you know, all those things that are, are very practical. We have Somebody to, asks a practical question. So it's yeah. like, okay, he yeah, yeah. says this, that, huh? whatever. So it was very interesting that he never wanted to get involved in that. Huh. But when I would, if I would walk him, or anybody who would walk him to, he would take the train in and out. So if you would walk him to the train, and once he left the classroom, boom, he would put on a hat of practicality. And we would, and you could have an interesting conversation. Was the, and when you go, so I'm at his shul, yeah. totally different guy. Yeah. Uh, it was such an unbelievable thing. Mm. And that's what I mean, that in the yeshiva, for some reason, they feel that they have to get on to the, uh, all the kashas that could possibly end up coming out the pill pool and everything else. Yeah. And so people f felt that the rabbis are divorced from us. And by the way, there's Rabbi Akiva, and uh, it's a famous statement in the Gemara, I forget where it is, but Rabbi Akiva, before he became Rabbi Akiva, when he was still just a, a shepherd, he said, if I, before I had learned 
So if I would have met a rabbi, I would have bit him like a donkey. Like a donkey. Uh, and there was a very bad, uh, a very bad bite, which he wouldn't heal from. Oh. That's how much he thought the rabbis were against them. Uh, which again, it was showing the disparity between uh, people learning and people not learning. Oh, wow. And so people hearing all these decrees that they were coming out, they would say, ah, these people are crazy, they're nuts, nothing's changed. <laughs> nothing's changed. But when you have, the, the rabbis came out with blank, ah, they're a bunch of nuts, they don't know what they're talking about, they're idiots. And really, it's because we're not connected. Huh. We're not connected as like they're connected. So, Am I going to say that they're right about who to vote for? I'm not going to get into that. But when it comes to making gazeras or edicts or enactments, we have to give them the, uh, the, uh, the respect that they deserve. When it comes to kashrut, and it came up with all these things with kashrut, before in the old days, you would hold your lettuce up to the sun and you look for bugs. Ah. Well, that's great if you have the sun out. <laughs> But what happens is, what happens if it's a cloudy day or it's at nighttime, we don't cater just during the, night, the day anymore. We now cater during night. So what happens? You have a light box. That became the new thing. Let's have a light box. And everybody's saying, ah, in the old days, we didn't use a light box. Oh. In the old days, you didn't have a light box. If you would have had it, you would have used it. Right? Say it again. If they had a light box. I would have used it, right. So, and so here's something that makes it easier. I have a light box, I put it on, I see what's there, flip it over, one, two, three, it's done. No, but because they didn't use it in the Altaheim, this, by the way, these are the people, these are people yelling the Altaheim, the old home, the, the old land, are the ones who have the iPods, everything else, that uh, they're all, you know, in the, but what they don't want Judaism to move unless they want it to move. That's how it works. Okay, so they would look at the rabbi and say, what kind of stupidity is this? Or when it became the glad kosher versus non glad kosher. Wow. In the original, uh, talking about going back to the 80s. Yeah. So, late 70s, yeah. 80s, when, when glad was becoming the, the new thing, the new thing on the block. Mm -hmm. Then everybody was saying, oh, what's the difference? Blah, blah, blah. And you know, they're all yelling back and forth. The rabbis are nuts. It's all a conspiracy. It's all, it may have been, I'm not gonna argue. But it was, it was all these things. And you're looking and saying, oh, who cares at the end? The marketplace is calling for something. Move with the marketplace. Leave me alone. Really so who, who, who's, who are the, the Rabbonim that you're talking about that are making the decision? Is, is the ones in the yeshivas or the ones that are out in the real world? Oh, so by the way, that's, that makes a big difference too. Because uh -huh. you have, if you look just in our, in our library here, you have the Aracha Shulchan, who was a pulpit Rav, versus the Mishnah Brora, which was a yeshiva, uh, it's, it's a, a Rosh Yeshiva. Uh -huh. So you see different, you see different approaches hmm. in both, both of these, you know, great scholars. Hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to demean one or the other, hmm. but you do see a difference in who's saying what. And today you have, again, it's a mixture of who they are. Rev Moshe was a Rosh Yeshiva. Yeah. He wasn't somebody in the quote unquote real yeah. world yeah. working in a marketplace. But yet who's going to say Rev Moshe was wrong? Hmm. Well, I mean, a lot of people say he's wrong, but, but the, uh, even when he was alive, they say he was wrong. Now they certainly say he's wrong. But he was recognized as a gadol. Uh, Rav uh, Vadi Yosef is reckoned, is, he's also passed away. He, uh, he's, rec he's recognized as he was, still is recognized as one of the gadolim. Mm -hmm. These people did work in something. They were brought up in certain ways. Yeah. But they, again, they looked at the question. They had a sensitivity to look at questions. Today is very hard to know who we're talking about. Mm -hmm was making decrees. Normally, it's now it's organizational. Now it's the OU, ah. it's the Star K. Yeah. When you get into Kashrut, it's, it's those sort of things. If you have uh, other questions that come up, so you have the, 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 the Gedolim of the Midwest would be Rabbi First, Rabbi, he's in Memphis, what's his name? I should no. forget his name. Uh, but he, he's yeah. there, forget his name. And then you also have uh, Schwartz, Reese, the CRC. Yeah, yeah. You have people who, you know, you would ask questions. Schechter, they have Schechter. Right? Yeah, they actually go out. And, uh, you know, right, so they, everybody's doing research yeah, today. I mean, it's really no big deal. Now, I just go on Google, 
You know, it's done. I, can, I know how to phrase a question. I know what's behind it. Now I can go and ask a logical question to somebody who would know more than me. Yeah, and, and like unlike the old days where you didn't you didn't have such access. Well, this is this is why also they they say to the average uh, uh, Balabatim, Balabatim, um that you should always talk to your shul rav because the shul rav has all has all those feelers going out and you yeah. have all the contacts and can right. sift everything together for us. So. Right, uh, that, that's one thing you can do. But like I said, I uh, ultimately. I would tell people, depending on what it is, go to Google. <laughs> get, get, figure out what you want to do, and then we'll see what's, oh, then we can go well. further. But just to give me a blanket question, I don't know. I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, I can go a lot of places with that. It's, it's gotta be a specific real life situation. Right. I mean, you gotta right. try to answer I always theory, tell people, if it's not a real question, yeah. If it's just theoretical, we can always... Theoretical, you can give a half a dozen different answers, right? right? Somebody yeah. asked, I remember, I remember yeah. somebody asked, all right, somebody, I, some, somebody came to me with a question, yeah, yeah. and I said to them, is this a practical question or is this a theoretical question? The person looked at me, 100%, 100% practical. Ah. So practical, okay, what is it? Tell me what's going on. Oh, oh, they told me, I said, this is a halacha. They said, what if, I said, whoa, whoa, <laughs> you said to me, it's practical. I answered you practical. Now, you, you can, now you're telling me it's theoretical. Theoretical, I don't answer. What? They said, why don't the answer theoretical? Is it because it's not worth my time? Because what if, what if, what if? I don't care what if. Tell me what's on the ground. That's how we rule. That's how Jewish law rules. They say, come with me for the next uh, six months. We'll study Gemara. <laughs> right, yeah. Make an appointment. We'll have a chorus. Right. Yeah. Don't, don't give me the what ifs. But that, like I said, is the biggest thing here. And we kind of forget that they were involved in the business world. They were involved in learning. They were the true... Uh, I hate to use the word because people take it out of context. They were the true modern Orthodox. In other words, living in the world, recognizing what had to happen, and using and, and bringing Torah into that. That's really, if you follow Norman Lamb's book anyway, that's what quote unquote modern Orthodox stands for. Not, because, not for leniencies one way or another. Yeah. It was a real hashka. It is a real hashkafa. Right, the, the halachic man. This is what I have to do. A, I'm a halachic man. I have to know how to operate, but I also have to deal with the world. You know, and it's all the chachidus here. So, like I said, uh, but I know that everybody would say he's the first chachidus. Right? Okay, but you know, like I said, I don't want to be condemned for everything they say. Just some of the things. But that's what you're seeing here. So let's go back. Okay, fine. So uh, then Amrile. So they said chazam bisra al pum dane. We saw meat resting on the mouth of a cake. So Allah baye amale basim chamrach. Your wine will be aromatic. Vatikuli alma lemizban bisra v'chamra minach. And everyone will come and purchase meat and wine from you, for you will offer products of superior quality. Rava ama. However, to Rabbi said takiv chamra. Your wife, your t your wife, your wine will turn sour. Viatu kuli alma lemizban bisra lemechamba, and everyone will come to buy meat to eat with it, for it will be unfit for drinking and suitable only as a condiment. So you're going to get less money. That's oh. the problem. Okay. Oh. He says the wine will become so sour that it can only be used as cooking vinegar. Oh. Oh. Okay. So Amre Amrele Chazan Chavita de Tale Bedikla. In our dream, we saw a barrel. That was hanging on in a palm tree. La Baya Amrale. So Tobai said, Medali is kach kedikla. Your merchandise shall grow to the heights like a palm tree. You ever see a palm tree? It's big. Go online. Make it tall. Google it. Make it tall. Yeah. <laughs> Google it. The Rav Amar, what the Rav he said, Chale is kach ketamre. Your merchandise will be as sweet like the dates of a palm tree. It will be sweet to the customer because you will sell it. At a low price. Alternatively, it means your, uh, that's Rashi. And then others say it means your wine will literally taste sweet, and sweet wine is deemed to be of an inferior quality. Inferior? Inferior, correct. Yeah. Apparently, uh, the Mug and David, apparently, and, uh, or what's the other one? Many Shabbats for inferior oh, wines. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. If yes. It says, if it says you will, you will sell it at a lower price. Yeah. 
Because nobody wants it. It's inferior. The answer is, by the way, you never want to sell it at a low price. You always want to buy low, sell high. It's always what you want. If you have... Uh, what was the word? Surplus. You, yeah, well, surplus maybe, but also if you have um, the thing, not competition, you you want to get more people, you want to get more of a more base of people uh-huh. buying your stuff. You sell, so, you, so you sell it for low amounts so more people want to buy it. That's what you call a loss leader. Loss leader. Loss leader. When I want, if I want to get people to come to my store, so I sell something. Let's say uh, I have, uh, let's say I have Coca Cola. Okay, so I sell Coke. I put a bag out of Cokes today, two liter at fifty cents. They're gonna run into my store, grab all the fifty cent Cokes. While they're there, though, I want them. They're gonna see my other products and they're going to buy it. Or I may want them. Let's say I'm selling Coke. I want them to come to my store versus your store. So I say, everybody's selling for a dollar, I'll sell it for 80 cents. Mm. And again, everybody's gonna come in. But the problem is with all that, I've lost money. In any business, you wanna make the most money you can make without ripping people off. Actually, you don't really care if you're ripping people off. The, it's the Torah is telling you, you can't rip them off. So, because really people don't, you know, why should, if I want, there was a, a case in Boston, before you were born, long before you were born, gas was yeah. 50 cents. Yeah. That was with the 1973 yeah. oil embargo. That's when it went up. <laughs> right, it was originally 20 cents, uh, went to 50 cents. There was yeah. one guy in Boston who, during this 1973, oil embargo from OPEC, yeah. they, they've never left the news as a result of that, was selling his gas at $1 a gallon. Something like that, one or two dollars a gallon, I forget what it was, but it was real price gouging, ultimate price gouging. And you could only get, and that, because it was gas limits, you remember? Yeah. You could only get 10 gallons. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that 10 gallons so you could get. Then you'd have to line up again if you wanted more. You couldn't fill your tank up unless you were a, you know, have, to, have to tank maybe. Maybe a commercial driver or something. Right, so what happened was, during the, during the day, there was no big deal, right? Because you go somewhere else, 50 cents. But he was open 24 seven. <laughs> that's what he decided, it was something like that. He was open at night while everybody else closed. So now there's a line, because they need gas. They're lining up by him. He was sued by the government for price gouging. And his argument was, who forced you to come to me? Oh. I didn't force you. I, I want this price for this amount. He lost. But the point is, as a businessman, he had every right to say that. I didn't make you. I'm not the only business. I'm the only business at 12 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. But who told you to wait? <laughs> Who told you to wait till eight to twelve? You should have filled up before you left your house. You know, and so that's so every businessman wants to make as much as you can because the more money you have, the more to- toys you can buy. That's what's called having a corner on the market. You can right. basically charge right. what you want to. Right. So now, if, so that's why if he had to sell it low, it's not what I want to hear anyway. Well, no, it's, it's not like I'm going to get more people. It's either my, my uh, merchandise is not go- as good as yours, or I, for some reason, I just want to lose money. By the way, if you think about these, um, let's look at schools for a second. You have the day school here, which is, thank God, thank God, a thousand times over, that is supported by some very generous people. But it, as a result, it's not about, as a result, Tuition is $5,000 a child. Very, very reasonable. And on top of that, the government, uh, now because of vouchers, it, it makes it even more reasonable. Really, there's no person who can claim at this point that cost is what's stopping the children from having a Jewish education. There's no, there's abs- that's a lie. Whoever says today that cost is inhibited in, in South Bend, Indiana, they're liars. They're just straight out liars, that's all. For, for, uh, for the day of school. Because like I said, with vouchers and everything else, it beats every price. You're basically going 
to, to a free school mm. and with some exceptions okay unless if you if you above the certain amounts then you have to and pay the five thousand say it again whatever well no the problem with eighty thousand dollars by the way is let's say you have five kids yeah they, so you, you just got killed in Chicago, they don't have that at all. okay but i'm just saying in south bend yeah. is very high but so what happens now you have stanley clark who is not they don't have generous donors who are keeping the prices down so i heard that there's something like a ten to twelve thousand dollars oh yeah, yeah. sorry that's like Right. So now, if you have ten to twelve thousand dollars, even with your voucher, still you still owe seven thousand, and so that's a lot of money. Now the question is, how can they charge that money when you have a public school that's free? Free. I mean, it's just my tax dollars, so I'm not paying into it. How are the other schools that are are less expensive? Where is their customer base coming from? You know what they would tell you. If you want the Stanley Clark name, you're going to pay for it. Yeah. So really, did I answer your question? You get my answer to you? Mm -hmm. It's all a matter of what's my name? What What are you buying from me? What's my commodity? If I have something that you want, you're going to be willing to pay my price. If I don't, then you won't. Then I have to make it a price that you all come in for. You understand? There's an upside to selling it low. Just Say it off. again, please. There is an upside to selling it low. Kill off competition and then raise the price back up to normal. Normal no, like, no, but you don't want to, you know, you can't, first of all, you can never kill all competition. Because right. once you go, all we have to, we know you have to go up. No, right. So we'll, we'll wait now, that's all. Oh, well, no, what do we have to do? The point is, uh, you want to understand that the better my name is, the more you want to pay. Levi's gets more money oh, okay. than Walmart's. Yeah. Because Levi's. Starbucks. Star, uh, Starbucks is Starbucks, insanity. Apple, Starbucks, Apple, uh, all these things. They get more money because of the name. That's all it is. It's just a name. They, they'll disagree with me, of course. But who cares? Let them uh, prove it to me otherwise. Yeah. You know, I don't drink coffee, but I'm, I'm guessing the Starbucks coffee is not qualitatively different than Dunkin' Donuts. I, I bought the Costco brand. K cups, it's excellent coffee. What's K cups? For a Keurig, single coffee. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It's good. Okay, <laughs> there you go. You gotta make it. Somebody else makes it. There you go. Somebody, somebody else is doing it. Factory to put different labels on. Yeah. Right, that's all. But I'm just saying that. So you understand? That's what you're dealing with here. Okay. Uh, so now the next one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Armale, they said to him, and one more. Uh, we we'll keep going for dreams here. So Chazan Rumana. So what happens? In our dream, we saw a pomegranate that was sprouting from the mouth of a cake. They have great dreams. Okay. So they told the Baye, Ashik, Aiskach, Kuruma. Now your merchandise will be expensive like that of a pomegranate. You will sell your produce, produce at a great profit. The Rava Amrale, Kave, Iskach, Kurumana. Your merchandise will be tart. Like a pomegranate, your wine would be bitter, <laughs> and everyone will therefore despise it. That's funny. Our they said to him, Chazan Chavita did not fall the vira. In our dream, we saw a barrel that fell into a pit. La Baya Amrale made Ba'e Iskach. Sorry? Right. Your merchandise would be sought after by people. Kita Amr Nafal Pita. The bira below ishtakach, as one it says, bread has fallen to the pit and has not yet been found. <sighs> so what does that mean? But I had to interpret the vision of the pit as a reference to this folk saying, the the saying that which alludes to scarce or sought after goods as bread that has fallen to a pit was taken as an indication that a buyer's wares would be greatly sought out. He would struggle to keep up with the demand to buy his merchandise. <laughs> There you go. At the Rav, the Rav Amar, the Rabbi said, "Fasid is kach v'shad le'lebere." Oh yeah, your merchandise would be ruined and would be thrown into a pit. That's <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay. Fine. Amar le, he said again. Chazinim baruch ama. We saw a young donkey, the Kai, 
uh, is Dav and Oar that was standing near our heads and praying. Labai Amar Le Malk Avit to Barhead. You told and this foretells you Abai that you will be a king. You become head of the academy. Bekaya Mora Allah and the speaker will stand to your side to announce your words to the assembled public. Now he says he explains you will become a Rosh Yeshiva, uh, Rosh Yeshiva and will deliver public lectures. In those times, a scholar would give a public lecture with the assistance of a speaker who would loudly proclaim the scholar's words to the assembled audience. The brain donkey beheld in his in the uh, dream was seeing as the as the speaker's as symbolic as the speaker's loud voice. The Rav Amar to him is a petachamor gahit. Uh, the words Petachamor, the first thing donkey, are erased from your tefillin. The what? The words Petachamor are erased from your tefillin. <laughs> so he says, oh. uh, yeah, that's what he's telling fine. So then he says, Armale, so Barhead said to him, Vov. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so Amale, so Rabbi replied to him, "Ledidi chazi leviite." I have myself seen my my tefillin, and the phrase is indeed there. Amale, so Bari said to him, "Vav de peter chamor vaday gahit mitfilach." Then at least the vav in the words peter chamor has certainly been erased from your tefillin. So he says the Hebrew word for donkey may be spelled in one of two ways: chamor with the chot chet. <coughs> Mem, Vav, Resh, or without the Vav. Tradition oh. has it that in this particular verse, the word is spelled in its shorter form. Barhedi informed Rava <laughs> that the one who wrote the scrolls of Tefillin erred, that is, he wrote the first uh, word, Chamor. He first wrote the word Chamor with his fullest spelling, then realizing his error, he erased the superfluous Vav. So Rav Yitzchak Asker, he says, comments that had described a race the vav after the word chamor had been completed, the fill-in scroll would be rendered invalid because the gap between uh, created by the eraser would uh, interrupt the word chamor. Rather, in Rav's case, the scribe had apparently realized his mistake before completing the word, and in place of the erased vav, filled in a race to complete the word chamor. Marsha notes that this particular interpretation of Barhedia tells a revelation of an accomplished fact and seems to have been co objectively correct. In this regard, it differs from the previous interpretations, which were for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's interesting. Because this, this, look at this even further. According to the Shulchan Aruch, I wonder if that would be possible. Huh. If you make a mistake, as long as you correct it before, so there shouldn't be a problem. Before you finish, right? Mm -hmm. If he wrote Petra Chamor and he wrote it with a Vav, so, and then he wrote, oh, wait, there's not a Vav here. So, and so he decides to erase it. That really shouldn't ruin the uh, tefillin. What does he do with that space? So, you know, what he did he was, right he wrote Petra Chamor, right? He wrote, Chet, oh. Mem, Vav. Oh, I shouldn't oh, put a Vav. Oh, oh. So he takes exactly. a Vav out, puts a race there. Yeah. Hear that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure that. That really should uh, do it. Let's see what happens. The Sof Azal Ravel Chude the Gabe. Ultimately, Ravel went by himself without a baye uh, to, to Barhedia to recount a dream from Amale. Chazit Dasha Baraita Benafal. In my dream, I saw the outer door of my house had fallen. Amale Ishtacha Shachva. Your house, your wife will die. Amale Achazit Kava Vishina Ditanar. I saw my molars and the front teeth have fallen out. Amale, benachmanatach shachvan. Your children and your sons and daughters will die. Amale, chazai tarte yone de parachan. I saw two doves that were flying away. Amale, terrain neshe megarshat. You're going to divorce two wives. Amale, chazit tre gali de delipta. He said, I saw two of the turnips. She said, Amale, terrain kufe balat. She says, You'll receive two blows with the clubs. Wow. Okay, so boom. He's giving him bang, 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 bang. That is, the blows will be administered by a club whose thick end will resemble the head of a turnip. Boy. So, okay. Uh, and the Gemara tells us that this last event occurred 
uh, to Rava on the very day. As a Rava who Yoma Vyate Be Midro Shekuli Yoma. So that day Rava went, sat in the house to study the entire day, which means okay, he says by spending the day in this tranquil environment, Rava hoped that he might prevent the foretold violence from actually occurring. Ashkach Hane Hanhu Tre Sagi Nahare, there he found two blind people, Dahave Kaminsku, Bahadi Adadi, who were fighting with each other, Azal Rava, the Paruk Kinhu, so Rava went to separate them, Umahu, but Rava of Tre, and they dealt Rava two blows, Dale, Lamachu, Achariti, they raised a club to deal Rava yet another blow, Amar Rava, but Rava said, Mistai Tre and Chazai, the two ends up for me, I only saw two in my dream. Wow. Not for you can't hit me again. <laughs> can't hit me again. Okay, we'll have to stop here. Yeah. Wow. <laughs>